part two. So part one was the introduction a few weeks ago, and we talked about how in the book of Esther it teaches us that God is at work in the details of life even when unseen. And as far as I know, none of us have seen God. But that doesn't mean that he's not at work in your lives. Amen? Amen. He's in, at work in our lives. September 28th, we had a high, high Sabbath here. But on the 30th, when my doctor called, I had to trust God. But I knew that God, even though I can't see him, he hears our prayers and as a result of that, I know that we worship a God that is unseen. And we're going to see that through this incredible, epic book called Esther. And so the story of Esther is one of divine guidance, grace, and care. But it also is a book that reflects what, as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, what we would call the great controversy. It reflects good versus evil. And you'll see that throughout the book of Esther. It really does reflect our human nature. Bible says that our human nature is what? Sinful. And it reflects that. It's a real life story that happened in Persia. And so this story is, even though God's name is not mentioned in the book of Esther, and we will see that. There's not one time that his name is mentioned as God, Lord, Yahweh, whatever. But he is seen through the lives of these incredible characters like Esther or like Mordecai. And so we talked about last time at the introduction four important aspects. There was the big picture that we will see, the big question, the big idea, and then the big deal. The big deal reflected the king in this narrative. And the king in this narrative was King Xerxes. And King Xerxes was an incredibly important and powerful man. And we will see that through the journey that we take through this incredible book called Esther. But before we go further, would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer? Our Father in heaven, speak to us today through your Holy Spirit. I'm just your messenger, and I ask that your Holy Spirit be our teacher this morning, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will speak through my words as we journey through this epic book of Esther. And so, Father, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together will be pleasing in your sight, and I pray this in Jesus' name, amen and amen. So now the curtain opens to reveal an extravagant banquet that King Xerxes is going to be whole. This clicker is not working, unfortunately, but we'll get those kinks. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. So King Xerxes now is going to be throwing an extravagant banquet in chapter 1. And by the way, in these 10 chapters of the book of Esther, we will go through almost verse by verse. And we'll go through all 10 chapters. Because I truly think that this is such an epic book filled with guidance, with grace, with God's care that we need to study it because it's, it, it could happen to us today in a similar fashion, in a similar way. So Esther, God behind the scenes. Well, unfortunately, it's still not working. There we go. There we go. God behind the scenes. So today, in part two, we're going to cover verse 1 through 15, chapter 1, and our theme verse for the entire, oh, for the entire series is taken from Romans 15, 4. Unfortunately, maybe I should just abandon the, the clicker. Because it doesn't look like it's working correctly. There we go. So this theme verse we'll, we'll read every Sabbath before we get into the book of Esther. And I think it is relevant to us. For whatever was written in earlier times was written for what? That's God's word. 
Amen? The Bible is a book of wisdom. The Bible was written over 2,000 years ago, but it's for our instruction so that through perseverance, and when you go through a trial, you've got to have perseverance. When my doctor called and said, you have bacteria and a bacterial infection, you bet I had to have perseverance. It was almost for me like a Job thing. What? And you got to have encouragement of the scriptures so we might have what? Hope. We, we should be, Christians should be people of hope. And as Seventh-day Adventist Christians, especially because we're look, looking forward to the soon coming of Jesus, and that is our hope, amen? amen? Our hope is that Jesus is coming as soon as possible. No one knows, but that's the hope that we have. So the book of Esther weaves this epic tale and it's an epic tale versus good versus evil heroin versus a villain and we will unpack that and sacrifice versus greed you're going to see this i can't understand why hollywood has not produced a movie verse by verse word by word because this is such an epic book it reads like a novella like a like a um what? Soap, opera. Soap opera, yes, thank you. I could only think about it in Spanish for, a, for whatever reason. But it reads like that. It's an incredible book, and it's not written just to women. Even though it's one of two books, Esther and Ruth, that are titled Women's Names. So while scripture doesn't challenge earthly rulers or provoke us to despise authority, it does recognize that God allows the rise and the fall of nations. And so in your sermon outline, you're going to see the next or the first fill in the blank. If we can get this, <laughs> I'm sorry guys, but this is, this is not working. Well, okay, well let's get into this. So last time I shared with you, that the big idea is God's providence in the book of Esther. What is God's providence? The word providence comes from the word provide, which has two parts. Pro, Latin, going forward, one be on, on one behalf of, and vide, which means to supply what is needed, to give sustenance or support. As a noun, providence has come to mean the act of providing for or sustaining and governing the universe by God. I asked for God's providence as I was being treated for this bacterial infection. And I knew that God was hearing my prayers and the prayers of my family. And so now we go into the, this first part. There we go. Oh, oh, oh. So... So we can get used to the sermon outline. You'll see the underlying portion is what you will fill in in your sermon outline. And so while the scriptures don't challenge earthly rulers or provide us to despise authority, it does recognize that God allows the rise and the fall of nations and kings, presidents and leaders, dictators and, and tyrants. That's just the way it is because of the human sinful condition. Everyone from ancient to modern times will someday bow down before the ultimate authority of Jesus Christ. You remember back, some of us remember back when Saddam Hussein thought he was invincible. And yet when he was exterminated, they found him in a hole. So the reality is that even if you're a tyrant dictator, a bad president and a good president, whatever, one day you will bow before Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we're going to start today in Esther chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to go to verse 15 in part 2, and then next week we will finish chapter 1. So Esther chapter 1, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. It reads just a little more modern than the King James and the New King James, which I typically use. Verse 1 says, these events happened in the days of King Xerxes who reigned over 100 
and 27 provinces stretching from India to where? To Ethiopia. At that time, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne in the fortress of Susa. Fortress is just another name for palace. It was his palace in Persia. Verse 3. In the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited all the military officers of Persia and Media, as well as the princes and the nobles of the provinces. Verse 4. The celebration lasted. Now, have you ever been to a party that has lasted 180 days? I, I haven't, nor do I want to. A tremendous display of the opulent wealth of his empire and the pomp and splendor of his majesty. He was a narcissist. King Xerxes wanted the attention upon him. So he throws this opulent, incredible banquet for 180 days. And scripture at this point makes us assume that it's all about him. In other words, he just wanted to show off. But that's not the real story. Because narcissists have reasons for doing things that sometimes we can't figure out. We see the extent of King Xerxes' influence. He reigned from India to Ethiopia. Xerxes was a very powerful man, not only a, a narcissist, but he was an extremely powerful man. That also tells us something about King Xerxes, why he wanted to have this opulent 180-day banquet. The picture builds of his greatness and of his significance because he ruled in a huge territory from Persia to India to Ethiopia. And if you remember your geography, Ethiopia is not in the Middle East. It's in Africa. So Xerxes was a powerful man. And so there was more to this banquet that meets the eye. Verse 2 says, Xerxes ruled his empire from his royal throne at the fortress. At the palace of Susa, he commanded everything. He was the most powerful man on earth at that time. And this is after Nebuchadnezzar's reign, okay? This man was a powerful, powerful man. And we see that the king is giving a feast. Actually, he's giving two feasts. He's not dumb. He's a very smart king. And scripture starts off with him giving a 180-day banquet feast. But his motives are a little different. And we'll see that. What type of a celebration, a feast was this? It's incredible that it was an incredible feast. Let's see if we can move this. Okay, there we go. So we, oh, oh, oh. so we see that the king is given this feast, but he's actually giving two feasts. The first one, as we've said, will last six months, 180 days. And it's an incredible feast that he's giving. It was actually a status symbol that the king could actually identify himself with the longevity of the celebration and have so many people come to it. He is showing off. So he's not just an intelligent man, but he's a, a showboater. Because he's showing off that, hey, I have the power, I have the control to be able to invite those who I want to invite for 180 days, if they, if they don't stay 180 days, which they didn't, but I still have that power that people can come and celebrate with me. The king needed to demonstrate his financial and political back to his financial and political backers that he possessed the resources to wage a what? To wage a successful war. See, he had alternative, ulterior motives, I should say. 
He wanted to get those nobles who attended drunk, but he also wanted to buy, pretty much scope them out because he had his, his eyes on taking another territory, enlarging his kingdom. He had his sights on conquering Greece. Instead of making it a trading partner, he wanted to take over Greece because he knew that Greece was a very wealthy country. Verse 3 says, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his nobles and officials. He invited the military officers of Persia and of Media, as well as the princes and nobles of the province. He knew that these were the most important people to come to this summit, this banquet. He had to schmooze with them, in other words. Verse 4, the celebration lasted 180 days. A display of, of opulent wealth of his empire and the splendor of his majesty. So he's showing his power. He's showing that he's got control. And rather than appreciating God's, God's blessings upon him and give glory to God, Xerxes is, doesn't have any desire to glorify God. It's all about me, myself, and I. He's accumulating this wealth, but he wants to also take over Greece. So rather than reflecting the glory to God, he absorbed the reverence for himself. And for us as Christians, that's a deadly ingredient that can kill our spirituality when we don't give praise to God. Amen? The last three weeks, um, I had to go through a... Um, it was an echocardiogram, but it was called a, a TEE T -E -E or TFF? No, TEE. -E. For those of you who are medical people, TEE, -E, I think it's called. And um, so I had to go through that. And my doctor said, um, we, we hope that this bacteria infection you have did not go into your heart and is stuck on your valves, on your heart. And when he told me that, I began to pray. <laughs> I hope not us also. And he says, we don't have an indication of that because the, the um, oh gosh, what was it? The ultrasound didn't show that. And so I went through that, and when I came out, the doctor was really happy. He said, hey, Jeff, you're good. And I didn't take that as, oh, man, I'm, I'm a stud. I just cried, and I said, thank you, Jesus. Because my doctor did say that if they found bacteria on my heart valves, it takes a different turn. And so I, I was being wheeled back to uh, the room that I was in because the doctor had me come to the hospital, and I was there just for a few days. Um, but, you know, those, those are times when you just, even if it would have went bad, I still would have had to praise God. I still would have had to thank God because I know that He hears our prayers. Amen? So, ra so the real purpose was to plan a battle strategy for invading Greece and to demonstrate that the king had sufficient wealth to carry it out. Waging this war was important to King Xerxes. He wanted to wage the war not only for his survival, but for a means of acquiring a bigger kingdom. This guy is an egomaniac. He's a narcissist. He's not happy with just having provinces from India to Ethiopia. He wants to expand it to Greece. He wanted more and more and more. Verse 5, verse 5 reads this. When it was all over, the king gave a banquet for all the people from the greatest to the least who were in the fortress of Susa. It lasted for seven days. So he was very strategic because now you're saying, wait, 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 Pastor Jeff, you just said, the Bible just said that Xerxes had a banquet for 180 days. He had two banquets. He had to take care of those who were his servants. 
those who helped to plan or maybe carry out the 100-day, six-month, 180-day banquet. And so scripture then says, from the greatest to the least who were in the fortress of Susa, it lasted for seven days and was held in the courtyard of the palace garden. Verse 6. Oh. I didn't insert that one. Verse 6. The courtyard was beautifully decorated with, with white cotton curtains, blue hangings, which were fastened with white linen cords, purple ribbons to silver rings embedded in marble pillars, marble, mother of pearl, other costly stones. Verse 7, drinks were served in gold goblets of many designs, and there was an abundance of royal wine reflecting the king's generosity. Verse 8, by edict, the king, by edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking. You can imagine what was going on. No limits. You can drink all the wine you want until your heart is merry. That's not really what he intended. He wanted them to be drunk so that he could plan. He wanted them to be drunk so he could take advantage. And so by edict of the king, no limits were placed on the drinking for the king had instructed all his palace officials to serve each man as much as he what? As much as he wanted. So as we study this book of Esther, verse 5, the king gave banquet for all the people from the greatest to the least who were in the fortress of Susa. So as we study this book, we will see repetition quite a bit. We're going to see King Xerxes mentioned quite a bit. We're going to see eventually Esther mentioned quite a bit. Eventually we're going to see Mordecai, her, her older cousin, quite a bit. We're going to see the evil villain, Haman, and there's a reason. But the first queen, we're not going to see her mentioned that much. Pretty much just in the first chapter. So the king follows it up with a feast that lasts only for seven days. A kind of a garden party, which is for the ancillary workers, those who helped with the 180-day banquet. The second banquet was thrown for the common people. After all, it was their taxes that had likely financed the king's first 180-day banquet. And so he's taking advantage of them, but then he's kind of rewarding them by having this other seven-day banquet. In verse 6, King Xerxes' courtyard or his garden was a magnificent-looking garden. Only the elaborate descriptions of the tabernacle and the temple surpass the vivid details that we see in verse 6. It was a palace. It was magnificent. And as, as Scripture says, the only thing that looked better was either the tabernacle and most definitely the temple in Jerusalem. We'll get this worked out next week. In the book of... <laughs> let's go back. So in verse 6... Uh, no, we... Uh, there we go. In verse 6, the courtyard was beautifully decorated with white cotton curtains. We actually read that. Costly stones. We find God's grace in the book of Esther. Power and the presence at work through the lives of five people that we're going to cover. And these are the five main characters through this in incredible epic book. So the first one, obviously, will be the king himself, King Xerxes. He's the first character that we see. The second one, the second one is his first queen, Vashti. And she's significant only in a few verses. And we'll see why she's very significant. Because she does something that not only upsets him, 
but is, well, well, we'll see, we'll see. The third character is the evil villain of the book of Esther, and his name is Haman. He's a very wealthy and influential officer in the court of the king. So he had influence into King Xerxes because he had a high position. And then the fourth person is this very wise, much older cousin to Esther. Now when I say much older, Esther was probably a teenager, a young adult. Mordecai was probably in his 80s, but she loved this man. He was like an uncle, like a parent, because at this point, when we go through the book, her parents were lost. And so he was family to Esther, a Jew living there in Persia. Now, why is he living in Persia? Because after King Nebuchadnezzar, after that era that we've studied in prophecy, the Jews were given their, their opportunity to go back to Israel. But many of them did not want to go back because they were already established in Persia. They were well-to-do. They probably had very good incomes. And Mordecai was probably one of them. Didn't want to go back. He, he already was established in Persia. That was his new home rather than to go back to Israel. And then the fifth character obviously is the one that's named after the book. And that is Esther. A young, beautiful Jewish woman whose Persian name means star. And it's appropriate since she's truly the star of this incredible story. And we will see how she is a star of this incredible story. And how she becomes a savior to her people. She saves her people like Jesus saves us. Amen? A young, beautiful queen who becomes the savior of the Jewish people. So that's the fifth character. So the book of Esther then, well, <laughs> I don't know if I'm pushing it too hard, am I? Push it downwards like this? Oh, point it this way. Oh, okay, okay. I will do that. Thank you. Thank you. I, I was always taught that it's rude to point. So, <laughs> so excuse me, I'm going to point it at you. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Okay. I'm pointing. Okay. So, Well, the book of Esther then is a slice of history from the life of the Jews living in exile in Persia. And this incredible, remarkable story is proof that God did not forget them and he won't forget who? Us. That's the God that we serve. He might be unseen, but he's working in the details of our lives. For six months plus seven days, Xerxes' banquets took center stage. Feasting, drinking, we're all in full swing. The courtyard drama escalates. Persia's Queen Vashti now makes her first appearance. Has anybody ever met someone named Vashti? Once in my life. Once in my life I did. And she was a very pretty uh, young lady. Meanwhile, another similar banquet, as we talked about, was being held for women this time. And who presided over it? The queen. So there's competition. Xerxes has a 180-day banquet. Then he has a seven-day banquet. And Vashti, the queen, says, hey, I'm going to also have a banquet, and I'm going to preside over it. Verse 9 says, at the same time, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. Verse 10, on the seventh day of the feast, when King Xerxes was in the high spirits, I, I, I think probably that more appropriate to say he was drunk. <laughs> high spirits because of the wine, he told the seven eunuchs. Now this is very interesting. Interesting. 
this term eunuchs basically means that there's seven men that have been castrated. I don't need to explain what that means. But they've been castrated because it was his feeling that if they're castrated, they can't have a family and they can't want to have a kingdom and he won't have to worry about them. That's pretty much why the king had the, those seven men become eunuchs. And, oh, sorry, this way. To bring Queen Vashti to him, he said to the eunuch, oh, okay, oh my goodness, maybe I shouldn't control it. Okay, okay. So to bring, he asked the eunuchs to bring Queen Vashti to him with the royal crown on her head. He wanted the nobles and all the other men to what? He had good taste. He had very good taste. To gaze on her beauty, for she was a very beautiful woman. But when they conveyed the king's order to Queen Vashti, she refused to come. And the king was not a happy camper. He was furious. He burned with anger. You dare not to come when I have called you to come, my queen? In verse 9, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the royal palace of King Xerxes. Vashti's name means best, for whatever that means. In Persian, it means best. It wasn't her palace, but she decided to give a banquet for the women. It was the king's palace. The king in this story is the big deal that we talked about at the introduction. Something that's very interesting, verse 10, and as I shared with you, the eunuchs mentioned, these eunuchs were castrated in order to prevent them from having children and rebelling and trying to establish their own dynasty. So the king is a very smart king, even though he's a narcissist, he doesn't want competition. And these eunuchs are important to him, so he has them castrated. Verse 11 says that the king was in high spirits because of the wine and made some poor decisions based purely on his what? We all do that. We all base sometimes our decisions based on our feelings. He's no different. The king wanted the other men to gaze on his queen's beauty. Yet her true beauty came from the Lord who also blessed her with integrity. And she wasn't going to allow this. Then in verse 12, Queen Vashti refused the king's advance. Queen Vashti wasn't going to allow the king to abuse her in a way. She refused to parade before the king's all-male party, possibly because it was against Persian custom for a woman to appear before a public gathering of men. That's why I mentioned it earlier. She was a woman of integrity. Yes, I'm Queen Vashti, but I'm not going to lower my integrity for the king because I know the king's motive. He just wants to show me off in front of all these men. Whatever the reason, her action was a breach of protocol. We have a problem, Houston. And it placed Xerxes in a very difficult situation because once the king made the command as a Persian king, he could not reverse it. So in other words, once he said, come, you have to come. You can't refuse the king. So it puts him in a very difficult position. When Queen Vashti refused to appear before the king, she committed a triple transgression. A woman who challenged the authority of a man, a wife who disobeyed her husband, and a royal subject who refused to follow a what? A royal command. Three transgressions. But remember, Queen Vashti was a woman of integrity. And Persian custom said, I'm not going to parade in front of men that I don't know. 
in the John Maxwell Leadership Bible, John Maxwell, who's a, uh, a guru with leadership principles, makes this comment under the law of influence. He says, when Queen Vashti refused to be put on display, King Xerxes grew angry. At the council of his advisors, he removed her from office, opening the door for Esther to take her spot. God works in unseen ways. Esther serves as a marvelous illustration of how God uses one person's influence to accomplish his plans, end quote. So even though Esther, excuse me, Vashti, was refusing the king, Romans 8.28 says all things work together for, for good. And so Xerxes might be able to control a vast area from India to Sudan, but he cannot control his own temper either here. And we'll see throughout the book of Esther that being the big deal as he thought he was, he'll discover he's subject to the king of kings and lord of lords. Amen? Even these narcissistic kings are subject to our God. As Christians, we recognize that God is behind the establishing of human authority. Our human authority only has relevance and significance in light of the authority of God. There's no doubt that King Xerxes thought that he was the big deal. But what we understand is that Jesus is the only what? The only what? Real deal. Jesus is the big deal. No doubt about that. The big deals of the world, whether they're in the 5th century B.C. or the 21st century A.D., will eventually bow down before the authority of Jesus Christ. We're told that in Scripture. Verse 13, he, King Xerxes, oops. King Xerxes immediately consulted with his wise advisors who knew all the Persian laws and customs, for he always asked for their advice. There was some sense in the king. Verse 14. The names of these men, you can pronounce them yourselves. But the most important one will be Mimukan, seven nobles of Persia and Media. They met with the king regularly and held the highest positions in the empire. Verse 15. What must be done to Queen Vashti was the question the king demanded. What penalty does the law provide for a queen who refuses to obey the king's orders properly sent through his eunuchs? He's not a happy camper here. And now it's time for Queen Vashti to pay. And how is she going to pay? She's going to be removed from office. The Greek historian Herodias stated that Persian kings surrounded themselves with a panel of wise advisors on whom the king relied for accurate interpretations of the law. It's just like, uh, say, the, the President of the United States has the Attorney General. He relied on these advisors to give him the advice that he needed so that he would not break the law himself. In this context, the presence of these particular seven men in verse 14 take a whole, takes on a whole new meaning. These seven princes are named, so they can't be confused with the seven eunuchs. The seven eunuchs were his servants, so to speak. The seven princes are his wise men who were in his, his household. In other words, they were still his servants, those eunuchs were. Verse 15, what must be done to Queen Vashti, the king demanded. He wants justice. He's upset because he knows that the queen has disrespected him. He wanted to show the queen off in front of drunken men. But that wasn't going to happen because Queen Vashti had, had integrity. Middle Eastern kings often did not have close personal relationships with their wives. And Xerxes demonstrated that. One, he had a harem. Because that was a custom in the Middle East at that time. Number two, he showed no respect for Vashti's personhood. Because he wanted to parade his own wife, the queen, in front of drunken men. And number three, Esther, when she became queen, he did not see her for long periods of time either. Perhaps the king was not anxious to discover the reasons behind her refusal. 
Perhaps heart-to-heart talks were not his forte because he only wanted the queen when he wanted her. Whatever the reason, he let the law lead rather than a relationship with his wife, the queen. Jesus also came to fulfill all that was written in the law and the prophets. He kept every letter of, of the law perfectly. Yet at Calvary, God poured out his full wrath for our sin penalty on Christ Jesus. So Jesus, not the law, is the path to righteousness. Amen? We can't use the law for righteousness' sake or to be saved. And we have the privilege of looking to Jesus and him alone to make us right before God. And that's one reason why communion is so important. Communion helps to remind us of the righteousness of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Communion helps to remind us of Jesus' sacrifice for us because we're the sinners. In closing, first we need to remember that it's important to see the details in the big picture of the story of Esther. Secondly, in your sermon outline, the big question. There's no doubt that God is present, even though unseen, in the book of Esther. Even though he might be unseen in our own lives. Third, the big idea, we see God's providence. And lastly, we'll continue to see the big deal, Xerxes, or the big dud. Because he is the big dud eventually, because he thinks that he's in control, but he's not. God is ultimately in control. So in our spiritual journey through the book of Esther, we will see that God is behind the scene. You already have seen that Vashti was a woman of integrity and she wasn't going to be paraded in front of all the men. Because God's providence is such that Queen Vashti's ordeal is the opening for the future of Queen Esther, who will what? Save her people. She is a type of a savior. God's word says this. Who knows if perhaps you were made queen, referring to Esther, for such a time as this. And Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good for those who love God and for those who are called according to his purpose. This is a, an incredible epic story that we will see real life we will see the drama we will see the sinfulness it almost makes us feel that we're in this story with Vashti or with Queen Esther and so next week we will start in Esther chapter 1 verse 16 part 3 would you bow your heads with me in a word of prayer Father God in heaven throughout scripture we see that there is a great controversy between good and evil. And so to begin with, in this incredible book called Esther, we see that there's already a contrast between the king and his wife, the queen. A contrast that she, Queen Vashti, had integrity and she did not want to go against Persian custom to be paraded in front of drunken men like drunken sailors versus what the what the king demanded and wanted because he was the king father we realize that you are behind the scenes throughout this entire epic book i pray lord that we will see not just this great controversy but we will see the mercy and the grace of how jesus led his people through this and especially how Queen Esther becomes a type of a Savior for your people. We are your people, and Jesus is our Savior, and we're grateful for that. In Jesus' name, the family of God said, Amen.